Okay, so let me preface this lecture with there is way too much information on these slides and I could not figure out a way to make it shorter without spending another two hours. So when I start skipping things or going yeah blah 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 do not strike me down okay so <laughs> trust me uh, um, this is I'm about done with this one um, okay so intrinsic defects that means that there's something going on with the red cell okay so it's the red cell issue that is causing this the red cells to be destroyed so um, red cell membrane abnormalities are, are big things okay so it's a lot of stuff that has to do with the with the red cell membranes themselves okay um, and a good number of them are hereditary they've been mutated they've they've been passed on um, there are a few that are acquired um, and then we're going to talk about the red, red cell enzymes that don't allow metabolism to work appropriately. Okay, so you guys remember that the red cell membrane was, you know, the basic phospholipid bilayer that has the proteins in it, but then inside the cell membrane is attached to the cytoskeleton and we had those anchirins and spectrins and stuff. If you re can't remember that, go back to the red cell membrane. I believe that's four or six, chapter four or six, um, where we talked about that. And it shows how the spectrin was holding it together and the anchirin was helping to keep it attached to the cytoskeleton. And, okay, so th those are there. Okay, um, part of its job is to move things in and out of the cell, including cations, so sodium and potassium. Okay, you know that because of the extreme elasticity and those that spectrum and anchirin and the way that they move through there, that the shape of the red cell and the elasticity allows it to get into really small spaces. Okay, so these are, this is a really important thing to understand that when something goes wrong with that red cell membrane and it doesn't allow for that elasticity or it doesn't allow it for to squeeze in those tiny little spaces that then the red cell is going to be destroyed. Okay. So hereditary red cell membrane abnormalities. Um, Hereditary spherocytosis and elliptocytosis are typically the more common that we'll see. Um, you're going to see those stomatocytoses after a bit, but the big ones are these two here. Um, and this is actually a subset of this one, so we'll, we'll get there, okay? Um, I forget what page this is on in your book, but in... This actually shows you, okay, so hereditary spherocytosis is mostly autosomal dominant. Oh, look, it's spectrin. So spectrin is defective, okay, or, and then elliptocytosis. Oh, look, it's spectrin again, but now instead of band 3, this is protein 4-1. Um, again, spectrum. Oh, look, band 3. Do you see how this is working out here? So you can, you can see that it tells you what proteins it is that were, that have a defect in them. Okay. That are causing these problems, right? You might want to keep this handy or have your book handy with this because it does really have a lot of information in it. Okay. So hereditary stereocytosis is autosomal dominant primarily. It's um, people of North European descent, okay, and pretty much the proteins, the anchirin and the spectrin are, are messed up, 
Okay, so they're not allowing the phospholipid and the, cytoplas the cytoskeleton to be linked anymore. And so because of that, then they, they disconnect and, and they become round. Okay, so that cytoskeleton, which are the bones, if all of a sudden your your skin was no longer attached to where your bones are, you would turn into a big lump, right? Um, or say your skeleton was detached from everything. So, you know, that's, skin can move anywhere then. Ooh, yuck. Okay. Um, so what happens is that then the, when there's that detachment, there's little pieces of red cell membrane that then form like little vesicles and, and move off of the red cell. And then it becomes a big, it becomes a spherocyte. Um, and then when they go through the spleen, um, they get trapped because the spleen has extremely little teeny tiny capillaries to catch the weird things. Um, and then they hemolyze. So we're going to see bilirubin increasing. We're going to see anemia. We're going to see the wonderful things that we normally see with hemolysis. So here's the spectrin and chiron deficiency. Um, and then either the band three or band, the protein 4.2 deficiency. Look, we have these little tiny micro vesicles, the little tiny pieces that are breaking off of here. And the more that break off, the more round it gets. Okay. So then it just gets stuck in the spleen and then the macrophages will take care of it and they'll de destroy them. Okay. So what do we find in here? Well, of course we're going to see spherocytoses. Um, so spherocytes are part of that poikilocytosis. Um, we're going to see polychromasia because we're not, they're going to lack that central pallor and there maybe probably will be a difference in cell sizes. So you're going to see anisocytosis. So because there is no central pallor, because it is rounded, you're going to see that increased MCHC. And then over time, and this will take some time, um, you may see anemia happening. Okay. If as the hemolysis increases and the anemia increases, your reticulocyte count will go up. Okay. Um, you're going to be looking for those hemolytic indicators, the bilirubin, right? Is the bilirubin increased or not? Did my LD increase? Okay. Because LD is run pretty frequently. So when you see LD going up, then there's something going on. The Lord knows where it came from. But when the bilirubin is increased too, then we can start looking at a few different things. Okay. So how do we figure out that this is hereditary spherocytosis? Well, one of the things that you can do is you can do an osmotic fragility test. And normally, you know, your red cells can take so much water in before they explode, before they lice. So with the guy, the spherocytes that don't have the spectrin and the inchiron to help to keep the cell intact and, and they're already kind of filled, when you add more water to them, so less um, hype, it's more, it's a hypotonic solution. Okay. There's more water in it than, than the salt content of your normal cells. When you add the red cells to a hypotonic solution, um, then they tend to burst. Okay. So you put these things in multiple solutions and then you see that, Hey, yeah, these spherocytes, they, they get destroyed and lice a lot faster than the other ones are, do. Okay. Now, can you only do an osmotic fragility test? Nope. Nope. Sure can't. Sorry. Um, because osmotic fragility just says that the red cell is more fragile than normal, that it tends to, you know, have a natural, a, a better tendency or an easier tendency and more likely to 
lice in a hypotonic environment. Okay. Now this ESN5 malleamide binding test, that's better. Um, because this is actually, we're, we're putting the fluorescent dye on those transmembrane proteins and when you don't have them, when you're missing those anchorin and spectrins, right, then you're going to have less fluorescence than you would in a normal cell. Okay. There is um, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis that you can do, and you can actually do molecular um, testing to determine whether or not the genes are present or if they're mutated. So, um, on a peripheral blood smear, your hereditary spherocytosis are just going to look like lots of little spheres. They're going to be have like no central pallor. They're going to be smaller, darker than your normal cells. Now, you can get spherocytosis as a result of having a splenectomy. Okay, you have a splenectomy, or you and you develop your spherocytosis. The spherocytosis is going to look different um, because in this you're going to start seeing these Heinz bodies and per they don't have any on here but you may see some Pappenheimer bodies as well because of the increased iron residue that is being left in the cells and Heinz bodies of course are that is that um, denatured uh, hemoglobin. Right? So, no, that's how it all about. Heinz bodies are DNA. Crap, I can't remember. Why do I always mess those up? Well, any food. How jolly are hemoglobin? Heinz are DNA, I think. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I can't keep it straight. I know. How are you supposed to keep it straight? I don't, I don't know. So, here we go. Um, it's been a long day. I'm really sorry. I'm really tired. I'm fed up with this. <laughs> I shouldn't be doing this, but I have to. Uh, so, here, clinical, clinical findings, lab findings, what do we see in hereditary spherocytosis? Your MCHC is going to go up, okay? Your RDW is going to go up, okay? Um, you're going to see hyperchromia really dense, so you're going to see the spherocytes and the polychromasia. Um, in the hemolysis piece, you're going to see the haptoglobin decrease. You're going to see bilirubin increase, LDH increase, right? Um, so decreased fluorescence in the ESN5 malamide binding test, increased fragility, right? So these, these are the, the things that I just talked about, okay? Big thing that you need to understand is why do spherocytes, why would they turn into a spherocyte? Why would it be, why, what is affected that's causing my cells to become spherocytes? Okay. So sometimes... Um, you can see, see, I did say, I said, or oh, no, I don't, um, um <clears throat> sorry, the complications that can occur, um, with hemolytic crisis, okay, so sometimes the patients have viral infections, it does not have to be part of a virus P19, okay, but if you have a raging viral infection, okay, you can have hemolytic crisis that follows that viral infection episode, okay, um, you can, all, they can also, um, experience folic acid deficiency because of the, um, increased need for the folic acid to make this stuff because they're being destroyed. Okay. Um, if we don't have a whole lot going on, then we're not going to treat it. We're just going to let it go. Um, 
if it becomes severe, we may give a transfusion. Or if it was hereditary and not because of we had a splenectomy, we're going to give a splenectomy. And with the splenectomy, after we have the splenectomy, I think I was, I'm pretty sure I put the wrong thing on that slide. Um, the splenectomy will remove the ability to strip those um, weird agents out of there. So the it you will see some foreign bodies. Now I'm this is driving me crazy. Okay, so I had to go and look it up. Even though I looked it up earlier today, and I looked it up last week, and I looked it up the week before that, because I always have this problem. I had the same problem with the muscles on the back of the leg, too, and I finally got that down. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, following the splenectomy, you're going to not, you're going to possibly see the, the Howell Jolly bodies, which are DNA. I just looked it up and I couldn't remember DNA that's left behind um, that's not going to get stripped because we don't have that spleen to pull it out anymore um, those macrophages in the spleen and then the Pappenheimer bodies might will be seen because there's excessive amounts of um, the iron and stuff like that in there so if you really want to know um, if it's hemolytic anemia that's caused by an immune disorder then you're going to see a positive DAT that direct antiglobulin test that you don't know anything about yet um, okay so hereditary elliptocytosis um, is autosomal dominant uh, condition that mostly affects um, people in the African and Mediterranean malarial belts okay um, I don't know why I can't answer that question. I don't know why, but that is the, where it is most common. And what happens is that we have, they have, um, mutations that affect the spectrin and protein 4.1 that help with that, um, linking the, the, cell membrane to the cytoskeleton but this way it it causes it to elongate okay so and they become elliptical over time it's they're not oval they're not spheros they're really like oval I mean not oval the elliptical okay um so in a homozygous condition, they're, they're, it's a very severe condition, um, but, and they can be lysed like crazy. In a heterozygous, then the patient may be asymptomatic and we don't really have a problem because the bone marrow will accommodate the issue, right? So my mild compensated hemolytic anemia. So you might see a little bit of a retic increase, a, decreased haplogobin you're going to see um a low mcv because these things are now weird shapes okay if they're asymptomatic we just let it go if they're symptomatic we may end up with that split splamect removing the spleen um or potentially maybe transfusing okay Hereditary pyropoikilocytosis is a subgroup of hemo or hereditary elliptocytosis. This is autosomal recessive, though. Hereditary elliptocytosis was autosomal dominant. So this one is autosomal recessive, which means that you need both of the parents to have this for the weird stuff to happen. Okay. So what do we see with these patients? Well. Um, we're going to see extreme poikilocytosis. They're going to have fragments. They're going to have little teeny tiny things going on. They're going to have all kinds of weird stuff. And when it gets hot, 
it gets worse for them. So one of the things that happens is you'll see cholelithiasis, which is gallstones, and the gallstones happen because of the increased bilirubin. We talked about kind of that before, like stones happening. Um, too much bilirubin causing weirdness. Um, but this is a, not incubated, okay? Um, so this is their blood, what it would look like normally. But then when you heat it and hold it at 113 degrees Fahrenheit or 45 degrees Celsius for about an hour, this is what it looks like. That, if I saw that on a slide, I'd be like, something's very wrong. <laughs> So this is what would happen. This was what happens to their cells. They become very distorted, and of course, with all that distortion, then yes, they're going to have some um, homolysis happening. Even with this, you're going to have homolysis happening. All right. um, Southeast Asian ovalocytosis. Again, this is a malarial belt thing. Um, autosomal dominant. It's for the band 3 gene, okay? What it does is it deletes it out or changes three different um, amino acids in the protein. So then they, the protein doesn't act right, and it increases the rigidity of the membrane, so it doesn't, it's not as elastic. Um, so it then the cells hemolyze a lot faster, okay? Um, basically, all we see is ovalocytes, and we don't treat it. Okay. Mutations that can alter membrane transport proteins. Um, th these mutations can produce either stomatocytosis or xerocytosis. Um, I know this sounds crazy, but you've probably, you're like, what the heck is a zero site? Well, if you look in your book, it actually tells you. <laughs> I know, that's such a cop-out, right? Um, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Um, for these different things that happen, um, the, the membrane, the red cell membrane, proteins the transport proteins um they they move things across they act as ion channels um and primarily one of the most important things that you have to worry about is those cations the sodium and potassium that are moving across the cell membrane and so when um when these cells lose the ability to regulate the volume of their cells like so they their transport proteins are not working properly um, then they can become hemolyzed because you know if there's too much sodium goes in then water is going to follow and if they can't get that stuff back out then they're going to explode I mean, truly, it's really not that difficult to understand. Um, but if too little sodium is in the cell, the water's going to leave, and the cell becomes very dehydrated, and it becomes what we call a zero a zero site. I can't even say this stuff tonight. Um, so on we go. Hereditary stomatocytosis or hydrocytosis is autosomal dominant. Um, the red cells are losing that ability to regulate their volume. Okay. Uh, because, just like I said earlier, the sodium comes in. As the sodium comes in, the water enters. The cell volume increases, but the surface area doesn't change. So... When that happens, then the spleens are like, oh, no, we got to get rid of this thing. Um, and it destroys this, the, the cell. Okay, so what will happen is the outer edges of the cell grow, get bigger and bigger. And then it just looks like that little coin slot in the middle of it because that central pallor is no longer wide. It just turned into a little slit looking thing um 
So the what we see are the stomatocytes. Okay, you're going to see a decreased MCHC because of the fact that you're getting a, a larger volume and the hemoglobin is not changing with that. Okay, so you're going to have less hemoglobin for volume of the cell. Okay, and your MCV, of course, will increase. <clears throat> so, like, instead of having this nice large area where we have that central pallor, right, this is starting to plump up and this is starting to plump up and as they start filling with water increasing the, the volume of the cell then you see this is getting fatter and this the pallor is getting skinnier right well then you get to a certain point and all we got is this little line where the central pallor is now and these are big puffed up areas the dehydrated stomatocytosis is autosomal dominant um, the potassium leaks out of the cell, the water leaks the cell, decreases the volume, it becomes dehydrated, it becomes what we call a serocyte. So in a stomatocyte, the hereditary, no, the overhydrated sphere or stomatocytosis is where we're gaining water, um, and then the dehydrated stomatocytosis is we're losing water. And so what we'll see here is the exact opposite. You're going to get smaller cells, increased MCHC, and you might see some stomatocytes, but you're also going to see some other things like target cells and Burr cells. So this guy here, yeah, we're going to see. So there's a target cell, a stomatocyte. Um, here's a couple. There's a Burr cell here. There's a Burr cell here, right? So it's really the the poikilocytosis is out of hand on this guy, right? Look at how little this guy is. Okay. Um, some other hereditary membrane defects. <sighs> um, the really important one that I've got to see that I've got to see in here is that um, there is a cryohydrocytosis, which is doesn't happen terribly often, um, but the leakage of the of the the cations from the red cells will will happen because of it got cold. Okay, so you get cold and you have problems then. Um, but the other one is very gen it's a very odd thing, but it is genetic and it is the rarest blood type that you can possibly have, uh, um, or rather a very rare blood type is an Rh null. Okay, so if when you don't have any Rh factors or Rh markers, um, then you can have problems that go with that. Um, the neuroacanthocytosis, sometimes we see um, people that have the neurological impairment and we're going to see the, the clinical picture of the acanthocytes on the on the peripheral smear and when we put that all together then we see that there is a that there is a problem um, and th these those people have uh, a lot of stuff going on so it's just not a good thing um, okay so here's your acanthocytes pieces and parts of cells um, with the A beta lipoproteinemia that we may see with the neuroacanthocytosis. Look at all this speculing. Okay. Lots of speculing. Mm, crazy. Makes it look really bad. Okay. Acquired red cell membrane abnormalities. These are a little different. These are not genetic. Okay. I know that sounds crazy, but this is not this is not a genetic thing to begin with here. Um, spur cell anemia. People get liver disease. It's really bad. When you see that, you're going to see these things with really long spurs off of them. And 
um, because they have the weird membrane shapes and, and, um, different, uh, movement through the capillaries, they also get, um, hemolyzed. Okay. So, um, because of the, the defect in these things, the, because of the fact that the liver, the liver is not making, um, the proteins the way that they should, it shouldn't, it's, it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, you may see, uh, some abnormal lipoproteins. Okay. So you may see an increase in, in triglycerides and, and cholesterol and stuff. Okay. Um, Paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Okay, ready? The cause of this is a myeloproliferative clonal disorder of the hematopoietic stem cells. What does that mean? The stem cells are going crazy cloning each other, right? Um, two to five out of every million people. This People do not get this very often, right? Um, but happens. So they lack the glycophosphatidyl inositol, the PG, the GPI that's on the surface of the cell, um, because they're lacking CD55 and, and or CD59 markers. Okay. So that makes them easily lysed by complement, right? So depending on what population you are, depends on, so what we do pretty much is we check to see, hey, how much CD59 do you have on your cells to figure out what level you're at and how bad things are. So most of the time, we don't find this until you're like 30 or 40 years old, okay, or, you know, 40 to 50 years old really. Um, but it can be found in childhood. It can be found much later in life as a geriatric. You can have very, very mild cases of anemia that, of course, your body can compensate for. Um, or you can have extreme severe anemia. When you see hemoglobinuria and hemoglobinemia, um, of course your haptoglobin is going to decrease. You're also going to see um, bilirubin showing up, right? So there are thromboses. So the thromb thrombolytic episodes can be a problem. Um, and in that, it, what happens is they can clog up the hepatic vein, which means that then no blood is leaving the liver. That would be very, very bad. Um, or they can clog up the little areas of the kidneys and then the kidneys start failing. Okay. Um, again, not so good, but you know, we can always get dialysis. Uh, what we see is microcytic hyperchromic anemia, but our iron studies are good, so it can't be iron deficiency anemia. Okay. If you look at the bone marrow, you can have any kind of cellularity in there, depending on what what class of PNH you have. All right. Um, so your iron is going to be leaving in the urine. You're going to have um, headaches and and stomach aches. Um, we're going to be looking, as I said, you're looking, looking for the CD59. You're looking for um, white cells that don't have that glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol on them. Um, there's a, oh, yes, um, the sugar water test. Basically, you put them in sugar and they lice a little bit easier than normal. And the HAMS test is acidified serum. Again, they're going to lice. Um, I have... These are old school, just so you know. Uh, I don't know if it's still on the registry, but the ham test was a big thing. These two were a big thing way back when. I do not know if they're still on the registry, 
but you definitely want to know about that CD59. You want to know that it's glu glucosal phosphatidyl inositol um, that we're missing, and you know that a hams test could be done, and whatever. Uh, how do we treat it? Well, supportive therapies, transfusions. You might want to need to. They may need some iron, or you may need anticoagulants, um, so that then they don't keep clotting everywhere. Um, uh, so this guy is. I don't know how to say this. Eculizumab, whatever it is. Um, it's an antibody that'll bond to the complement, so that the complement will stop. Um, lysing the cells through that MAC complex. All right, red cell enzyme apathies. Okay, G6PD, glucose six phosphate dehydrogenase. It's a huge thing, and I'm gonna tell you, there are way too many slides on here for that. I can't get, I can't figure out how to get rid of them all. So I'm gonna breeze through these things. I'm sorry, but I'm going to. There's a lot of information in the book and on these things, but G6PD, I can tell you there's like five things that I needed to know. Period. End of story. And it sure as heck isn't going to take as much as all these slides make. All right, so here we go. G6PD, the gene for G6PD for glucose 6-phosphate both the phosphate dehydrogenase, I can't say it, talk it, can't say it, phosphate dehydrogenase, dehydrogenase is on the X chromosome, okay, so the gene is on the X chromosome, that means it's an X-linked um, disease, so guys get it, women, maybe not so much, right, um, so it's, could go either way. Um, G6PD helps to protect the the hemoglobin from get, getting oxidated, oxidized, right? Remember, this is all about that glutathione, um, making sure that we have enough glutathione to keep things going and, and keep it from everything from getting oxidized. If you don't remember that stuff, uh, I went through that in chapter six or seven. Okay. The hexose monophosphate shunt, it is in the hexose monophosphate shunt. Um, it is really important that we understand what its role is. It has to do with moving things forward, taking them back into the, into the cycle. Um, highest prevalence of G6PD deficiency are in areas where malaria is present and the cool thing about it is if you have a G6PD deficiency it actually protects you from being infected by malaria by the plasmodium organisms okay so what the heck happens um, G6PD deficient are red cells can't generate enough um, reduced NADPH to to reduce that glutathione and we need to keep that glutathione um, reduced so that we can keep detoxifying all those things that are being oxidized okay um, so we need to if we don't have it then they're not going to be able to withstand all of the oxidative pressures and damages that happen to the cell. So it will um, decrease the, the hemoglobin solubility, which, there you go, d d the hemoglobin is Heinz bodies. Okay, the Heinz bodies will, will be there um, because of the hemoglobin. I'm telling you, I looked it up five times. I still can't keep it straight. All right, so um, G6PD it can cause an acute hemolytic anemia. They can be drug-induced. They can be infection-induced. They can just be all different kinds of stuff that you have. I don't know why she has mothballs on here because I cannot, for the love of me, money, fi figure that one out. But I will tell you that um, people in the Mediterranean belt that ingest fava beans and this is a big thing this will be on the registry somewhere um fava beans 
if they eat the fava beans then they can they will have some severe hemolytic um, episodes okay. uh, <clears throat> this protects against plasmodium falciparum which of course is the most deadly of the plasmodium species that causes malaria um, and so you have lots of stuff going on there all right um, Classification of anemia is normocytic, normochromic. You, on a right smear, you're going to see schistocytes, you're going to see spherocytes, you're going to see poikilocytosis, you're going to see anisocytosis, you're going to look for those Heinz bodies with a super vital stain, right? Because you can't find them otherwise. Um, again, you're going to see decreased haptoglobin, increased bilirubin. Your DAT will be negative because it's not an immune thing. Um, so this is what we can see. Here's your little Heinz bodies. Once you super vital stain them, um, lots of crazy, weird anisocytosis and poikilocytosis. Um, to diagnose it, the quantitative spectrophotometric assay is the most important. Okay, it is considered the gold standard, and Mrs. Collins had the little equation there. The equation is found at the bottom of page 355. I took the equation away. Um, but quantitative spectrophotometric assay, it's measured at an absorbance of 340 nanometers. Okay. Um, not that that's terribly important, but, you know, maybe. Um, to treat it, you get rid of the, the stuff that's causing the problems. Um, a lot of them are self-limiting, and most episodes will resolve without any type of treatment whatsoever. Okay? Pyruvate kinase deficiency, if you remember... No, you probably don't remember. Way back when, when we did in chapter 6 or 7, whichever one it was, um, pyruvate kinase um, was the enzyme that was the, the one that was the rate limiting step in the red cells breaking down those glucose and utilizing glucose. Okay, so um, <clears throat> when we're moving through this whole thing that's an important thing to understand is without that we're not really going anywhere um it is an autosomal recessive condition the gene mutation is on pklr yeah okay what the heck is pklr right um what it is that is the actual gene that codes for pk in red cells red cells and liver cells Okay, um, so with this, we're going to have the PK deficient cells are not going to be able to produce enough ATP or the 2,3-BPG, the biphosphatidyl gly, 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 glycerate, that's what it was called. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a long day. Um, but if you don't have the PK, you're not going to get enough energy. And if you're not going to get enough energy, you're going to be tired. So the good thing is that the 2,3-BPG isn't going to be there either. So the 2,3-BPG is the one that stabilizes the oxygen, the, the hemoglobin and, and doesn't uh, allow for the affinity, right? It decreases the hemoglobin affinity. For oxygen, well, now that that's decreased, we don't have enough 2,3-BPG, two, then your hemoglobin is just going to continuously offload the oxygen at the, at the areas of the tissue. So you may not notice right away that fatigue and, and things like that. So um, because of that, they're, you know, unless there's some weird thing going on, you, they may not notice right away. But... Um, in the beginning, if you, if we notice this quickly, cause you know, it's going to cause a problem. Um, you're going to see anemia when they're very, very small. 
you can see hyperbilirubinemia. So, of course, they're going to have jaundice. Um, you can have, there's all different things. In these, the bone marrow, aplasia, skin, skin ulcers and stuff, those, those are in folate deficiencies. Those are less common, okay? So what are we going to see? Hemoglobin can be all over the place, but you're going to see reticulocytosis. You're going to see niso, poik, polychromasia, and burr cells. How do we test for it? Well, really, you need to do... Um, find out whether or not you got the pyruvate kinase there. And you can do that by looking for the pyruvate kinase in the cells or by checking their genes out. Okay, so how do we treat it? You do a splenectomy. And after the splenectomy, of course, you're going to see those Haljali bodies and you're going to see the Pappenheimer bodies again. And I think I'm done. So this is what a PK deficiency thing goes. Here's your... Pappenheimer bodies, they're not very dark, they're not very prominent, um, but then you got the Hal Jolly body and it's there, okay? So, review questions, I'm telling you, they're not, look, what are Heinz bodies? Ugh. Heinz bodies are what? Hemoglobin. What are <laughs> Hal Jolly bodies? Oh, they're, you know, DNA stuff. All I can do is you got to keep, I, I'm thinking I just figured it out. Heinz, Heinz ketchup red hemoglobin. Got it. Maybe next time I'll remember that. <laughs> All right. Bye.